Hi, I'm Lori Alt. I am a staff engineer with Sun Microsystems, and I'm the project lead of the ZFS Boot Project, which is the project to enable the use of the ZFS file system as a root file system on the Solaris operating system. So what does it take to be a root file system? First, obviously, you have to be able to boot off of it. Um, ideally, you'd like to have robustness characteristics, such as mirroring. You have to modify the installation procedures for your operating system in order to set up a root file system of that type. Uh, you need swap and dump support supplied as part, of, as part of the features of the file system, the root file system. And then you'd also like to have ongoing management capabilities, such as upgrade, patching, snapshots, and so on. So I'm going to do a very quick overview of ZFS, just uh, to tell some of the features that matter for the purposes of, of booting and uh, acting as a root file system. ZFS enables storage devices to be grouped into storage pools. Once you've grouped the devices into the pool, then you allocate space from within the pool instead of on a per device basis. Pools have redundancy and robustness features, such as mirroring and RAID. Data sets are um, an object within the pool that could either be a file system or a raw volume, and they're allocated entirely from within the pool. That is, you no longer have to associate a file system or a volume with a particular slice on the disk. And ZFS uses copy on write so that it can perform fast snapshots and clones of data sets, and a clone is a writable snapshot. So why use ZFS as a root file system? First of all, there's a benefit to only having one file system type in order to manage and understand. Assuming that you're using ZFS for your data, you'd like to be able to use it as your root file system as well, so that you really only have to understand and learn how to manage one file system type. Second, ZFS has many features that make it an excellent root file system, which I'll be going into. And then third, at least for Solaris, it's the coming thing. Um, all of the um, enhancements, new features, new management tools, new installation tools that will be forthcoming with Solaris and Open Solaris um, are really based on ZFS. And so um, in order to take, make use of that, you'd like to be able to move to the, 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 new, um, the, the new operating system for Solaris, the new file system for Solaris. Okay, go on. Um, so some of the features that matter for root file systems. Um, the critical one, the biggest one, is pooled storage. And for the purposes of installation and use as a root file system, um, the fact that we don't have to pre-allocate space for a root file system in advance gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, file systems only use as much space as they need from within the pool, and so you don't have to pre-allocate a certain amount of space for them. Um, ZFF, ZFS pools have uh, built-in redundancy capabilities, such as mirroring, that are implemented at the pool level, so you don't have to um, set up individual mirroring at the file system level. And ZFS has unparalleled data integrity features. The on-disk consistency is always maintained. There's no need for an FSCK command to um, repair your file system. And um, that, integrity th that data integrity is as useful for your root file system as, and your system software as it is for your data. More features. Um, ZFS supplies, um, has features snapshots and clones, which are writable snapshots. Um, to take a snapshot and a clone of a file system, the process is instantaneous. It's nearly free. It's, it's persistent. The snapshots persist beyond reboot. And they are unlimited in size and number, except by the size of the pool. Um, ZFS also features volumes, um, Z, which are called ZVOLs, which can be used for um, in-pool swap and dump areas. That is, you no longer need to set up a separate slice for your swap space and your dump space. One pool does it all for you. So um, traditionally, a uh, file system, a, a system, um, um, a system disk might have been laid out something like this, where you have two disks where the, and, and each of them divided up into separate slices. You have a slice for a root file system, perhaps another slice for another root file system, a slice for your swap and dump, um, uh, for swap and dump, and then one or more slices for data, slash export and whatever else you have. If you want them mirrored for robustness pur purposes, prior to this you would have had to mirror 
each file system individually. Now with ZFS, we have just one pool. So on this disk, um, we call it just one big pool. We have, um, in this particular case, two different root file systems, which I call root A and root B. Um, we have swap and dump in here, and we have any number of data file systems as well. Um, they are simply within the pool. They don't, they don't take a particular piece of allocated space. They grow and shrink as they need be and use whatever space they need. And if you want mirroring, you mirror the whole pool instead of having to mirror the slices one by one. So I want to talk a little bit about the process of booting Solaris um, because that's a critical feature or a critical necessity of a root file system that you have to be able to boot off of it. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how booting works and how the process of booting Solaris has changed um, um, with when ZFS is your root file system. So there are three stages of um, booting for the most part. I mean, it varies according to different systems, but with Solaris it basically breaks down into three stages. There is a PROM phase um, in which the, um, the, the, the system initially comes up, the PROM in turn loads a booter, um, the booter in turn lo loads the kernel. So three stages of booting, and I'll talk about all three of these stages and how they're impacted by ZFS. The PROM phase, um, at the, the PROM phase, which is either the BIOS on an x86 platform or open boot PROM on Spark, identifies a boot device somehow. Now, the boot device might have been defined within the BIOS as the default boot device, or it may have been defined because the user brought up a, uh, the, the, the BIOS um, interface or the open boot prom interface and selected um, a different boot device whatev using whatever the syntax is for the, for the, uh, the particular prom. And so one way or another, when you make it to the end of the PROM phase, you have identified a device as your boot device. The PROM now loads and executes a booter from the boot device. Okay? Uh, the booter is the next stage. It's, an, it's a you know, sli slightly more sophisticated piece of software than, than, than the PROM. The booter has to select a root file system. And, um, the booter then, once it selects the root file system, it loads one or more files from the root file system into memory and executes one of them. The executable file is either part of the Solaris kernel or it's a program that knows how to load the Solaris kernel. So next, the kernel phase. Third part, so now that the kernel is loaded, the kernel uses the I.O. facilities provided by the booter because uh, right now the kernel doesn't have its own I.O. facilities just yet. So it has to use the booter's I.O. facilities to load all the drivers and the file system modules and whatever is necessary in order to mount the root file system. Once the root file system is mounted, then um, the, uh, the kernel is basically up and running for, the pur for our purposes, and all subsequent I.O. is done by the kernel itself, and the booter can basically falls out of the picture. The, um, the root file system is then mounted, and then the remainder of system initialization is performed. So now talking specifically about how that this gets impacted by ZFS. Um, at the PROM phase, booting ZFS is essentially the same as booting any other file system type. The boot device identifies a storage pool, but it does not identify a root file system. This is one of the big differences between booting ZFS and booting UFS, or just about any other kind of file system. With UFS, once you've identified a boot device, you have uniquely identified the root file system that you are going to boot, because there can only be one root file system on a particular device. With ZFS, because when you, when you identify a device, uh, you're really identifying a pool, and a pool could have multiple root file systems. So with ZFS, you have to have an additional step somewhere along this procedure in order to select which root file system within the boot device you're actually going to boot as your root file system. Now at this time, the booter which gets loaded on x86 platforms is GRUB 0.95. And on Spark, um, we have developed a standalone ZFS reader as, our, as, our, as the booter that gets loaded by the PROM when you boot off of a device that's set up for ZFS booting. So now the, um, this is where ZFS begins to have some real impact is in, is, in, is in the booter phase. 
So as I said before, with ZFS, there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between boot device and file system. A boot device identifies a storage pool, but not a file system. And the storage pools can contain multiple root file systems. Thus, the booter must have a way to select among the available root file systems in the pool. And not only this, but ideally, you'd like to have your booter be able to identify a default um, root file system. And you'd also like the booter to provide the user with an option to override that default. Um, so ZFS root pools, pools in general have pool properties. But there's one particular property called bootFS which identifies the default root file system for that, um, for that pool. And there are various ZFS, you know, the ZFS, the zpool command can be used to modify this. So we need some kind of control file that lists all the available root file systems um, that are available in that pool. So where do you put it? You don't really want to put that file in any particular root file system because it's, it's bigger than that. It's, it's, it's at the level of selecting root file systems putting it within a root file system doesn't really make any sense. So our answer is that we put the, um, the metadata, which lists all of the root file systems that are available on the pool, inside what's called the pool data, the pool data set. Um, in ZFS, data sets form a hierarchy. Every pool has a data set in it, which has the same name as the pool. It's at the top of the hierarchy. There's always, it's always there. There's only one of them, and you can't delete it. So it became a good place to put data for us that was pool-wide as opposed to something that related to one particular data set. And so that's where we put the, um, the, the control file that lists all of the, uh, the, d the bootable data sets within the, um, within the, root, pi within the root, root pool. So um, specifically looking at x86 platforms. So on x86 platforms, as I said before, we use the grub booter. Um, grub it, it uses a file um, which is stored out in the, the device that it is looking at. It's called menu.list. And it lists all of the available things that you can boot from, from grub. Um, grub des the, the grub syntax designates one of those entries as the default um, the default uh, entry, to the, de the default item to be booted. So if you simply type boot and the timer runs out or whatever, um, you end up with the default. And the way our software sets up the menu.list file in x86 is that default entry is set up to mount the pool's default root file system, as indicated by the pool's bootfs property. So we're talking about two levels of default. There's grub's default, there's the pool's default, and the way we've set things up is that the default, in we, the default entry in Grub boots the default entry for the pool. But it can be overridden by selecting other entries from the Grub menu. On Spark platforms, um, we use also a file we call menu.list, just to keep it consistent, even though we don't have Grub on Spark. Um, it also lists the available root file systems. We don't have a, s a menu capability on Spark like Grub, because um, it's just you know, uh, the open boot from is just different. And so what we have implemented instead is that um, the open boot prom, so the, the booter that gets loaded, will, if you simply type boot or boot disk, it will find the value of the bootfs pool property and it will boot that data set. But if you want to boot another data set, you can use the minus L option to the booter, so it's boot minus capital L, and it will give you a list of the available data sets that can be booted. And then it will show you how to boot that, you know, it will give you the command by which you can boot the, the, the one you select. And then you then have to type in the command. The, the menu does not actually boot it for you, it, but it tells you exactly what to type in in order to boot the particular um, data set that you want to have as your root file system. So um, from here on out, after the booter phase, um, oh, I'm sorry, we're still in the booter phase. But from here on out, it's, 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 um, e everything is the same between Spark and x86. So once the root file system is identified, 
the booter needs to load certain files into memory. And it, it knows the, the file name that it needs, and it's going to resolve that path name within the root file system that has just been identified as the one that you're going to be booting. So the booter loads the kernel's initial executable file and whatever files is necessary and then jumps to the kernel in order to execute it. So now we're into the kernel phase. The booter has passed some information over the wall into the kernel through uh, boot properties, which are the mechanism by which uh, information is passed from the booter to the kernel. First of all, it's, it's passed in the device identifier of the boot device and it's passed in the name and type of the root file system as arguments to the kernel. Now, because the root file system is ZFS, the ZFS file system, the kernel knows then to go load the mount root function for ZFS and call it the ZFS mount root function. It has that information that was passed over from the booter. It reads the pool metadata from the device that was identified as the, pool as the boot device initializes the pool, and then mounts the designated data set as root. Once the root file system is mounted, then the system is up and running and Solaris is booting. So that's the whole boot process. Now I want to talk about what a boot environment is. So a boot environment is a root file system plus all of its subordinate file systems. That is, any file systems that get mounted underneath the root file system. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between boot environments and root file systems. A boot environment has exactly one. And, and a root file system all by itself is a boot environment. A boot environment, which we sometimes abbreviate as a BE, I mean, in almost all the tools that manipulate these, we call them BEs. Um, the boot environment's a fundamental object in the Solaris system software management. Um, there can be multiple boot environments on a system varying by version, patch level, or configuration. Boot environments can be related to each other. For example, one BE might be a modified copy of another BE. And by using multiple BEs, you have, you have the ability to do safe application and testing of, computer of configuration changes, and I'll, and I'll discuss that more. So, um, when you think about the process of maintaining system software, of applying patches and upgrading the software and adding new packages, modifying the way it's configured, um, if you do that in place on your running system, it's, it's very risky and it's, and it's time consuming because you really have to quiesce the system in order to do that in many cases depending on the kind of operation that you're performing. So an alternate way in order to do that kind of maintenance is what I'm calling a clone and modify model of system updates. So the idea is that you take the, the boot environment that you've got and you make a copy of it. So you essentially clone it, make a copy. And then instead of operating on your running environment, you operate on the clone. You upgrade it, you apply patches to it, you reconfigure it, do whatever you have to do with it. And then once you have that updated clone BE, you boot it, you try it out. And if it works, great. If it doesn't, you've still got the old one to go back to. So, you know, many advantages. First, it was much safer. Second, you didn't ha the system couldn't be active while the, uh, all this operation is going on because the thing being updated is not the currently running boot environment. There are tools um, that are available in order to do this kind of system update. The one which is available right now with um, Solaris and has been available for quite a long time with Solaris. It's called Live Upgrade. Um, it does the cloning of boot environments for the purpose of safe upgrades and patching. There is new install technology under development that will also support the clone and modify model. I'll talk a bit about that later. And ZFS is ideally suited to making this clone and modify model work. It makes it fast and easy and space efficient. And so both of the clone and modify tools that we have, both live upgrade and the ones that are coming down the road, will work much better if your root file system is ZFS. And in fact, really, the newer install tools will require that it be, be Z, ZFS. You won't even be able to do this kind of clone and modify with the, um, the long-range install software unless you're running ZFS as your root file system. So let's talk about clone and modify, how it used to work back in the days of UFS. So in UFS, because you had to 
partition, if you had to pre-partition your system into slices, you would have a slice dedicated to root. You might have another empty slice that you used for this process, and then you've got your swap and dump slice, and then you have some number of data slices. So what you would typically do is you would clone root A into, um, into this empty slice, and of course that, that took a while, because you had to literally copy the whole thing over. And then you would operate on the clone, boot the clone, and, y and, and you can go back to the original one if the clone doesn't work. So that's the way it worked with UFS. With ZFS, because everything is allocated out of a single pool, we assume that we start out with uh, this pool that it's got a root file system, uh, I'll call a root, uh, a particular boot environment. It's got swap and dump volumes. It has um, some number of, of uh, data, data sets, such as slash export. And so the first step is after you do the clone, now you have within the pool, you have the clone of your root. But you didn't have to allocate a particular slice for it. You can, in fact, you can clone it again and again. You know, it's just, it, none, none of these require more space at the time. And then you operate on it. You either upgrade it, you patch it, or whatever. And so within the pool, now you have your original root file system, your updated root file system, you still have swap dump and your data, data, and your data sets, and um, you haven't had to do any kind of reworking of the partitioning on the system. Um, the way boot environments work within ZFS is that a boot environment can be composed of multiple data sets. As I said before, it can only have exactly one root file system, but it can have other data sets in it. And regardless of how many data sets, however, compose the boot environment, the clone and modify tools, whether it's live upgrade, live upgrade or the new tools that are coming, uh, will treat the boot environment as a single management object. So you as an administrator don't have to worry about individually cloning and snapshotting the pieces of the, um, the boot environment. It, all gets, it, will all get, uh, it can all be managed at once with the tools. So here is how you would do a system upgrade um, on a system that's running with a ZFS root file system within a root pool. Um, this is low risk, almost no downtime system upgrade. First you use the LU create command which has the effect of cloning your, um, uh, your current boot environment. It creates a new one called, in this case, S10U6. You issue the LU upgrade command, which says upgrade this particular um, uh, boot environment using this particular um, uh, Solaris medium. And I just realized there should be a minus U there. But, um, and then the third thing is once you've created, you've, you've created the environment, you've upgraded it, now you activate it, and now you reboot. And you're up and running working with your new, op your new environment, and you can still go back to the old one should you want to. So what happens during this process that's a safe upgrade? The LU create, as I said, it does a ZFS snapshot of all of the data sets in the current BE, and then it clones them to create writable copies. Now this process requires almost no additional disk space and occurs almost instantaneously. Because ZFS cloning works by copy on write, the data only starts getting copied as you modify it. Initially, it, 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 it takes no additional space and it happens just you know, really fast, which is a huge improvement if you've ever used live upgrade with UFS. It can take a long time to, um, to create, just, just to copy, and with ZFS it's, it's almost instantaneous. Then you do the, the live upgrade, use the LU upgrade command to, um, to upgrade this new BE using a particular installation medium, either a CD or a net install image or whatever. Um, and during this whole process, the system remains live. It's still running the original BE. You don't, need to, um, you don't need to take the system down during the upgrade of the clone. And the upgrade still takes a fair amount of time. I mean, the whole process of doing the package ads and such, we, um, that, still, that still takes a while. But it, you don't have to have your system down while you do it. And then, of course, as the upgrade one runs, it's going to gradually increase the amount of disk space used as copy on write takes place. And, but the new space is required only for files that are modified by the upgrade. Kay. So once you've completed the, the, the upgrade, now you use the LU activate command in order to make that, that, that boot environment the new active BE. 
So at this point, both the old one and the new VE are available from the boot menu, but the new one is now the default. You reboot the system, your new VE comes up. Or maybe it doesn't, maybe it's got a problem, in which case you can go back to the old one. So you can select either one, and if for some reason that new VE fails, you, you, can, you can boot the one that you know worked before. And then at some point down the road, you can use the LU destroy command to actually get rid of the old VE. So um, a little bit more information about how we uh, manage, how we've implemented boot environments from within ZFS. As I said before, boot environments can be composed of multiple data sets. Um, by default, we install all of Solaris into one data set. Um, if you have, you can have ad additional you can add optional directories later on, like if you want to create a directory for zone roots or something like that. They'll typically be in their own data set. You, you probably wouldn't want them to be part of the roots own data set. And then um, you can optionally put the slash var directory into its own data set. That's the only one right now. Now we've gotten some, there's been some pushback on that and that might end up get getting changed in the long run, I don't know, but right now you can only set up slash var as a separate data set. And the reason we do that is that some environments require that for security reasons because they believe that um, you can prevent, it helps to prevent denial of service attacks that would come if you filled up your var file system. Uh, swap and dump support. So um, with UFS, swap and dump uh, used it had its own slice. And if that slice wasn't big enough, you had, to, you had some difficulty finding additional space for it. So um, you can still, so by, oh, sorry, by default with ZFS, swap and dump are set up as ZVOLs, that is volumes within the pool, which means that you don't have to have extra allocated space for swap and dump. You can, however, still set up swap and dump on a disk life, disk life if you really want to. Um, some environments, such as those where root pool is stored in compact flash, they have reasons that they might want to have uh, um, a swap and dump on a, on, a, on, a, on a separate slice, but it's not the default. And swap and dump with, ZFL, with ZFS, if you're going to use ZVOLs, they have to be separate ZVOLs. You can no longer share the two within, um, a, as you could before. And that's a hard requirement. Some of the requirements that had to be placed on the way that we implemented ZVOLs for dump made it impossible to share that space for swap. So you really do, do need two separate ZVOLs. There's a few limitations. Uh, currently, root pools can be n-way mirrors only. That's the only um, variation we allow on, the, on a root pool. You can't have striping and you can't have RAID Z. And we hope to relax this restriction in the next release. And then secondly, on Solaris, root pools at this time cannot have EFI labels. And the reason for that is that the boot firmware does not support booting from a disk with an EFI label. Um, if, you and if you need to migrate from UFS to ZFS, we have made provisions for that. First, you have to start with a system that's running a version of Solaris that does support ZFS root, which means you have to somehow get your system up to either uh, Solaris 10 update 6 or Nevada build 90 or later. Once you're there, then you can create a pool on some other available storage on the system and then you use LU create to clone one of your UFS boot environments into the ZFS root pool. Once that's done, you can boot off that root pool and then any further updates can use the, the standard ZFS cloning. But the initial step, you, you really do have to do the copy from UFS to ZFS, but LU create will take care of that for you. So let me talk a little bit about how um, ZFS boot has impacted the process of installation. The existing in Solaris installation software, that is not the new open Solaris uh, installation, but the, the, the legacy um, installation software that's been around for a long time on Solaris, has been adapted in order to set up a root pool and a root data set and install Solaris into the root data set. That's pretty much the core of what we implemented there. This will work with both the interactive install and the profile-driven install known as Jumpstart. Um, it does not, however, work with the install GUI. 
So um, that's one, we did not modify that. Um, we so you, you, but you can, you can always use the, 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 the curses based install on any system. And then of course, jumpstart can always be used on any system. The interactive install now has a screen that comes up as you go through the installation process. It will ask you whether you want a UFS or a ZFS root file system. The default is still UFS, but you can select ZFS. And the customization features are quite limited here. I mean, if you think about it, there's all kinds of things you might like to do to these pools and data sets, you know, all the, the ZFS features that you might possibly want to uh, use, whether it's compression or something like that. And right now, the interfaces don't give you the option to do those kinds of changes. Long run, that will be coming, but this is pretty much bare bones support for getting ZFS, ZFS um, onto a root file system. So the installation of the future. Um, there is new installation software, which is currently under development, which will leverage ZFS's capabilities from the outset. The, the, the legacy install software for Solaris was written in the days of when UFS was you know, really the only, it was, was, was the main, main file system, of course, and also in the days when disks were very small. And um, a lot of the design decisions made in that install software don't move forward so easily to ZFS. The new installation software being developed right now is designed to use ZFS from the very beginning. It's really designed around the features that ZFS offers. And installation will be much easier with ZFS. There's no need to slice up a disk into separate volumes, and it's, 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 it's just much easier to lay out the, uh, the space on a system for a ZFS root file system. There is a new packaging uh, mechanism called IPS, which also leverages ZFS's features. And an early version of this software is available with the latest version of Open Solaris. And uh, information is available on the Open Solaris website at this URL. And for further information about ZFS boot, um, we also have a, a URL for our project where you can review the information and follow the links to documents that uh, will tell you more about how to use um, ZFS as your root file system. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>